My name is Michael Boucher, and I'd like to welcome you to the first Bitcoin conference to be held in South Africa. And quite possibly, Bitcoin Events, uh, the organizers of this conference, plan to make this an annual occurrence. And uh, we're hoping to have a great inaugural event today with many more to follow. Just over two years ago, Bitcoin was trading at $5 per coin. It then famously shot up to over $1,200. And as of this morning, it's trading back at $224, depending which exchange you look at. Conference is an opportunity for yourselves, the delegates, to meet some of our businesses and people already involved in Bitcoin, as well as to learn from and share ideas and information with those people around you. We're equally honored by the uh, presence of all of our speakers, all of whom are extremely smart people and experts in their field, and many of whom have traveled many thousands of kilometers to be with us here today. So what do all these speakers have in common? They're extremely, they're all extremely passionate about Bitcoin. In fact, I would go so far as to say that they're Bitcoin holics. This conference would not have been possible without the participation of our sponsors, and I would like to thank them now, based on the companies that are represented here today, it is clear that the financial service industry is extremely interested in Bitcoin and its role in the future of financial services. Many of the, the major South African banks, financial institutions, government and regulatory bodies are represented as delegates of this conference. Please help me welcome Jonathan to the stand. Hi, thanks, thanks very much for having me. Um, I've just flown in from London um, and I have a little bit of a cold from the airplane, so apologies if you can't hear me or I sniffle during, during this speech. Um, Bitcoin basics and beyond, most speeches at a Bitcoin conference that talk about 101 start with the story of how the speaker actually sort of uncovered or, or discovered Bitcoin. In my case, I was sitting in a pub in Oxford and I was talking to a friend of mine who runs a security business. And he said to me, we should build a trading bot to take advantage of the arbitrage between the different Bitcoin exchanges back in early 2013. Um, I said to him, you know what? I'd love to make a lot of money doing arbitrage trading, but at the end of the day, I wasn't born a trader and I wasn't going to get involved in this market in that way. But anyway, it sparked an interest in me in what was, what was really at the core of the innovation in Bitcoin. And as an economist, I looked at it and uh, you read the white paper and there were, as you can get in any white paper, there were citations of lots of previous research. There were, um, the work was dependent on, you know, the early cryptographic research by David Chaum in the 1980s. It was dependent on, on Adam Back's hash cash in 1997. And you realize that a lot of the moving parts on the computer science side were actually already there for Bitcoin to come into existence. And that Satoshi put together these computer science moving parts in order to have uh, an economic system. And in fact, what I would describe as the core innovation in Bitcoin is in fact the ability to have an autonomous economic system that is outside of the current financial industry. So when we talk about, um, when we talk about Bitcoin and we, we talk about the technology, it is actually the technology behind Bitcoin inextricably linked to the economics that are at its foundation. So what are, what are, these, what are these economics and how did Satoshi manage to bootstrap a, um, a completely peer-to-peer peer decentralized economy that has brought us all to this room. So at the foundation, he, uh, you know, this was actually an, an evolutionary process. And, and I'll go into like, some things that not a lot of people really understand, um, that Satoshi was probably working on this 2007, 2008, and there were actually early conversations with fellow people on mailing lists about some of the design features, some of the core design features of Bitcoin. An example of that is that, you know, transaction fees, which are uh, current in, in our everyday life in financial transactions, weren't actually thought of in the Bitcoin protocol until November 2008. 
Um, even though the, there were conversations going, Satoshi hadn't actually put a, uh, a mechanism in there uh, in order to have transaction fees uh, to incentivize people to process transactions. So initially what was, what was thought out was there was going to be some reward, some creation of new Bitcoins that was going to incentivize people, participants in this economy to process transactions on the network. Um, and when we talk about that design, we also didn't want it to be limitless. Satoshi had to find some way of convincing everyone that these tokens that were being distributed for people um, validating and processing transactions were going to be valued someday um, at a higher price or, or some value. And so the limit was put at 21 million coins. The distribution um, was sort of predetermined. Once you connect to the Bitcoin network, you actually agree to those sets of rules. Um, eventually, the supply starts out at, at roughly 50 Bitcoins every 10 minutes, and then over time falls in half roughly every four years. And what was expected was that the transaction fees were going to rise uh, in order to incentivize people to process transactions. Um, now, when we say process transactions in Bitcoin, it's not exactly like the payment processes that we've seen uh, in traditional financial markets. Indeed, in a lot of ways, it's very different. Um, firstly, it's all automated. When someone spends a Bitcoin transaction, effectively what they do is that they are announcing to the network that they are in possession of a certain private key that corresponds to, um, that allows them to spend the Bitcoins associated with that private key uh, in the Bitcoin blockchain. So you actually have this system where if I check that someone has the valid private key, I process the transaction. There is no, that there is a very simple rule whether a transaction is valid or not. If you compare that to something like a traditional market, um, something like Visa, there might be a hundred software vendors that are checking every aspect of that transaction to see whether they should consider processing it or not. In Bitcoin, it had to be that the network had to be censorship resistant. So we did not want anyone to be able to say that this transaction is not valid. The possession of a private key is actually everything in the Bitcoin network. And for those people who work in traditional industries, we know that change takes a long time. Change takes a long time because uh, you know, there's, there's huge amounts of inertia in, in corporate governance structures. There's lots of incentives in middle management. And the interesting thing here is that people are saying, well, I'll wait. You know, Bitcoin might not be there today to solve any problems. Um, it's not really addressing any of my business needs today. And so I can wait the five years that it will take for this, this uh, software to mature for everything to be proven that we don't have a hack a week at the exchanges so that you know there's now 100 million consumers instead of the maybe 5 million users that there are today. But the, the thing that I posit to those people is that you have to admit that the, that the process that you go through um, in order to innovate takes maybe five years. There hasn't been a significant um, banking software project that has actually taken off within the, like, core software engineering takes almost four years. So if it's going to take that long in order to actually harness the potential of this technology, then we need to actually start thinking about these issues today. And when, when I go into a, uh, a corporate bank and I say, in the UK, we have this big problem. I'm not sure what the, what the situation is in South Africa. In the UK, we have this big problem that uh, every, every bank says, Bitcoin, do you have a Bitcoin account? No, no, we'll shut your account. Or like, there's, there's not a single UK bank that will give a bank account to uh, a Bitcoin company. And this is the state of play today. And I, say, I go into the bank and I say to them, okay, so let's, let's look at your traditional AML processes. You're checking to see if, I mean, you're doing the most rudimentary checks on, um, on each individual in your bank. And you say, 
is their name spelt like Edward Snowden? Well, obviously, Edward Snowden, if he has a bank account, is not going to spell his name Edward Snowden. Um, or, you know, you, you, get these, you get these ridiculous rules that, that databases of fraud and, and stuff are updated on a weekly or even monthly basis. And you're, I'm not talking about South Africa, by the way. This is in England, okay? And everyone is, is there thinking that, you know, this market is, is more, more dark, more complex, less traceable, less easy to send funds cross-border. And uh, in the end, that, that, that is a difficult debate that needs to be actually had because we have real-time information, we have one centralized database that you can put information into, and actually you have a, a very um, willing community to engage with any regulations that, that need to come up against it. And I think that, you know, I'm starting to see things change in London. I've seen in um, some of the major banks people in the risk department start nodding their heads and say, well, hold on, there are actually elements of this that are, are way better than what we do at the moment. And I think that that will continue and will actually uh, help inject capital into this economy. I'd like to say that I, as anyone in this space, I go through waves of uh, falling in and, in and out of love in Bitcoin. And also I, I, go, in, I go in phases of, thinking some things about Bitcoin and then having them radically overturned only months later. And it's an iterative learning process that I've been going down for the last three years. Um, I've written blog posts that actually conflict what I said a year ago. Um, and really, I think that the current status of where my, where my mind is with this is that I'm currently very much focused on bringing um, a Bitcoin agenda forward for, for any conversation because even that you can pick holes in the, uh, in the economic model and, uh, you know, I spent a year writing a thesis about how every, every Bitcoin miner today on the Bitcoin network is behaving completely irrationally. I learned more about the traditional financial markets and how our economy works and how we consider value through looking at Bitcoin than I did for studying for years and years about traditional micro and macroeconomics. And what, what it brings me to is that, um, you know, if you can solve some of the issues around identity in drug marketplaces that are completely illegal in the US, and you can form reputation systems, and you can think about punishment strategies for people who are anonymously validating transactions, if you can solve those sorts of issues, you can solve a lot of um, issues in traditional services, and you can actually make much more robust and resilient uh, computer systems with higher auditability, with, with greater transparency. And I think that um, that is the promise of this technology, and, but it needs to be experimented with in traditional services. It needs to be radically shaped in the startup world with people um, with big ambitions on, on how they want to change large-scale infrastructure projects. Um, and I hope that the next two days can be filled with um, those types of conversations, and uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to hear any questions on basically any any Bitcoin 101s that have a, a, anyone's got a, a knowledge gap that's missing in uh, in the Bitcoin 101 space. Um, I think now would be a great time to address those sorts of questions. Um, and if you, yeah, I'm happy to answer anything else. My question is, why is it, it why is it so impossible to find that stuff? Um, you know, surely if you've got that number, you can trace it or if it gets put into cold storage, when it comes back onto the network, there should be some alarm bells. So I'm just, I'm a bit confused about all of those, those missing Bitcoins that everyone talks about. Yeah, great question. So, um, and it actually, it actually relates to um, sort of something that, I was, that I'm trying to capture in uh, the, the beginning half of my talk where I say, there are no such things as Bitcoin coins. There's, there's no provenance. So you can make certain types of transactions. Take a, a coin join transaction, for instance. So if I, if I take, uh, if 10 of us get together and we say we want to make one transaction and all of us have one Bitcoin and we pay 10 people in the room or even ourselves those same 10 Bitcoin, 
there is actually no mapping from inputs to outputs. And so who am I going to go to? Out of, if, if one of those Bitcoins was the Flexcoin Bitcoin, who am I going to go to out of those 10 people and say, it was you, you've got it, you've got it, or you've got it. And, and actually, the way that a lot of the Bitcoin businesses on the network architect their systems is actually to enforce this sort of fungibility. Is to, um, I will take deposits in from, you know, 10 consumers, and I will make one transaction that splits that into, some goes into my hot wallet and some goes into my cold storage. And I would say that the closest way that you have to tracing those stuff is um, an algorithm called MinFlow, which is basically that I'm gonna say, what is the minimum amount of coins that could have gone from the Flexcoin hack to um, this exchange, for instance. And if that comes out at zero, which a lot of the time it does, you can't say anything definitive about the flows of funds between them. I'll say that like at, at Chainalysis, we tackle this on an entity level. We look at um, Flexcoin interacting with uh, Camp BX or, or any other exchange and we have a look and we say, um, at least give you the institution to ring up and say, listen, can you investigate this account detail further? Because the, at some point when you go into one of these entities, the trace on the Bitcoin network is gone, but you might still have an entity to go and talk to to recover your coins. Um, I hope that I hope that answers your question. Do you see what ha is happening on the block uh, on the blockchain actually different from the existing banking network? Because my understanding is that if I put fifty thousand rand into my bank account and I split up where it goes, surely the same rules apply. Okay. Do you want to fire with the second question? Um, the second question is actually relating to um, proof of stake systems and. Um, things like Stellar and Ripple, and where you see the, the primary advantages of protocols like that, and what they actually are, because obviously I've got questions about the security. Sure. Um, so the first question, um, bank tracing rules are mostly legal fictions. So um, essentially what you have is, if you're a thief and you say, deposit 50,000 Rand into, into your account, and then um, you already had 50,000 Rand in that account, and you start to make payments, the law actually decides which money you're spending rather than the bank themselves. The bank doesn't keep track of you know, individual currency units inside their bank, but the law says that we do keep track of bank accounts like coins. So um, in, the, in the UK law, for example, if you're a thief and you make off with 50,000 pounds, and then you start spending 50,000 um, pounds out of a bank account and your total balance was 100,000 pounds, the money left in your account is completely the stolen money. You have no of your own money left. You spend your own money as a thief before you spend the money of the person who you stole it from. So um, you, um, and th th this is actually quite important because actually some of this actually could relate directly onto the Bitcoin network that the Bitcoin network could say one thing and the law could say something else. Um, so, um, and in, in just to sort of finish on the differences between Bitcoin and banking is that banking fundamentally is an account-driven system. You have an account with a value attached to it. Bitcoin um, is, uh, is a, a little bit more complex and, and actually it's just the reassignment of individual transactions. Um, and so it's a, it's a flow-based system rather than an account-based system. Um, the question around Stellar, Ripple, proof of stake, I mean, essentially what, what you've got is um, if I could identify nodes on the network and I could develop trust relationships with those people, we could process transactions far faster wasting zero electricity. Um, in fact, you know, with Bitcoin versus proof of stake, the, you know, the core advantage is that with Bitcoin, there is no need for any sort of social consensus. If we have a mechanism, because I can verify, with proof of work, I can verify that the history that I'm, I'm following has a certain amount of work associated with it. Whereas um, in proof of stake and, and also in Ripple and Stellar, you could actually, you can't necessarily validate that. And you actually have to fall back to some sort of social consensus. That I go and ask my friend who I trust, is this really the right version of the history of transactions that I'm looking at? And if you have that ability to have, you know, 
ask everyone in this room or ask the five people you trust, then you can actually get um, a good, much more scalable system than something like Bitcoin. Bitcoin's much harder to scale because it says that you can't have, you can't rely at all on any sort of social consensus. Um, so that's, that's the trade-off that you kind of get into. From a consumer perspective, I'm just um, slightly hazed about how does the value of Bitcoin determine? I mean, right now, in terms of currency, when I'm in South Africa, a cup of coffee is 15 rand, and it's so much to the dollar, etc. So my reference point is very much in line with currency exchange. So in, in Bitcoin terms, as a consumer, if I want to use it and purchase it, how do, what's my reference point in terms of value if I go from one country to the next? Yeah. Um, so good question. I mean, right now, right now, the, 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 the price of Bitcoin is set in the marketplace. So you you have the same way that we have foreign exchange. The RAND is set um, basically on supply and demand for RAND globally. <coughs> um, and so in the, in the, in the, the problem that you'll have, though, is that um, there might be discrepancies between BitX and Coinbase because the people trading at Coinbase can't necessarily get accounts and trade on BitX. Well, that might be a might be completely mis uh, uh, that might be a miscarriage of justice, but um, you actually, um, if it were easy to trade on all Bitcoin exchanges worldwide, you'd expect the global price to come to some particular value, and it would just be like another reference currency, like you have with foreign exchanges. I think currently we're still sort of growing as an industry, and there there could be small arbitrage opportunities between the different currencies. So you might see sort of trading at a slightly higher premium in South Africa because um, maybe people want to escape currency controls or um, and can't uh, and might bid up the price of Bitcoin or low liquidity but essentially you'd have one global price and it'd be set by the market I think we're gonna uh, finish there